it's 25 past now, so I may as well kick off um, with a few introductory words. Cool. Um, so yeah, there's there's a brief agenda over in that document as well, but basically the agenda is going to be that I'm going to run through some slides, and amongst the slides there will be some uh, survey questions, Slido questions for you. So the important thing here is for you all to head over to slido.com uh, or click on the link in in the um, in the Google Doc. Um, and if you head over to slido.com, you can enter this this meeting code. Um, and that should the, um, I guess most of you will have probably used Slido before, but basically as I work through the slides, the, the questions that are relevant at, um, at, on each slide will pop up and you'll be able to give, give answer to, answers to them. Um, and you can do this on your mobile or you can do it on your computer, um, whatever's easiest for you. Also in that Google Docs, there is, um, there's a section called resources needed to take part. Um, there's that slider link there. There's also a bit of background reading, um, which is an article that a few of us wrote last year that I'll, I'll mention briefly, um, that kind of forms the basis for this session. Um, there's also a link to the slides there, if you want to see the slides after, after the event. Um, and then there's a, se there's a section at the bottom called questions and notes uh, from the survey, basically for you to write anything down that, um, that comes to mind or you want to, yeah, basically that anything that comes to mind that you want to say about, about the session, um, feel free to just jot it down in, in, at the bottom of that Google Docs session. So hopefully that's given you all a chance to get to Slido. And then as if by magic, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that you'll all, all be presented with this question now. And if you're not, then I don't know what to do. <laughs> I've got a thumbs up, that's cool, nice. So you can see how this is working. This is obviously a bit of a tech check and a warm up question to um, test what the weather's like here. Um, it looks like I'm the only one in, in a place where it's rainy because it's chucking it down up here in Lancaster. So, <laughs> but that's okay. That's, that's, that means it's good to, um, good day to be inside if it's rainy, I suppose. Um, We've got 16 participants here and we've got 14 responses and I haven't responded. So I think that's a pretty good turnout. Partly cloudy seems to be the dominating theme here. Cool, good, that's working. And then another bit of a warm up question for you, um, but a little bit more on theme for this session. Um, so I want you to think about software reproducibility um, or maybe reproducibility in general and think what the first things that spring to mind what does it mean to you and kind of describe that in one word or maybe two words a small phrase um, and you can answer as many times as you want uh, and that would be that would be really good if you do give a few answers of just a few things that spring to mind when um, when somebody says software reproducibility and this time i'm not showing the answers right up um, but once everyone or most of you have put some answers in, I'll move on to the next slide and that should give us a nice word cloud. I always feel during these Slido sessions that there should be some hold music that you can put on whilst people are <laughs> jotting down answers. Cool, I'll give you a few more moments and then we'll then we'll move on. And whilst they do, I'll check the chat. Surprisingly sunny in Bristol. It's just up north, it's rainy. <laughs> cool. I'm gonna move on. Nice. So documentation, environment, ease of use. Um, are the big things that come out and then portability, reuse a few times. Um, we've got sustainability, lots of different themes coming through. That's cool. That's interesting. Okay, so I've got a few, few background slides what this session is about. 
Um, so there's this there's this um, article that a few of us in the SSI published last year, um, and it came out of a session where basically we were aiming to um, tackle the age old question of how do you make your software reproducible. Um, and we kind of flipped this on its head, that question on its head um, during this session and, and decided, well, instead to ask the question of, well, how reproducible should research software be? Um, and the obvious conclusion that kind of jumps out at you if you ask that question is that not all software needs to be at the same level of reproducibility. Same level of reproducibility. Um, and we kind of ran with that concept and used that to develop um, a set of levels of reproducibility to give to give some structure to this this problem of software reproducibility. Um, and these are the four levels that that we came up with: um, barely repeatable, software for publication, software as a tool, uh, software as infrastructure. I'll go into a couple of these in in a little more detail in a second, but broadly speaking, it goes from the barely repeatable stuff that is, you know, scripts that you might run once or twice to produce a graph, um, to soft through software used for publications. So this might be models that you use in the publication, or it might be um, a graph that you publish, um, but stuff that's not necessarily useful for other people or not useful um, for multiple outputs. Um, and then as you go through to software used as a tool, this starts to become stuff that's more broadly useful. So it might be useful for more people. It might be useful for more research outputs. Um, and then the highest level software as infrastructure. This is the, the kind of stuff that starts to become really useful for lots of people. Um, and it's you can think of it as like the ubiquitous software that you might see in your research field. Um, or more ubiquitous software that's that's this is quite a broad level that is, is widespread has widespread use in the community um, and then just a comment that there's there's lots of parallels here with other work that's gone on like stuff in the Turing way um, Turing way talks about a reproducibility matrix um, and they also mention this free air framework um, which again structures software into into categories of repeatable rerunnable portable extendable and modifiable um, and you can absolutely draw parallels between these and map these levels onto each other so these aren't definite things okay this is a bit of a complex question um, you should now see a list of um, what I'm terming best practices, tools, and techniques. Um, so these these are some of the things that you can do to help ensure reproducibility. Um, and there's things on the list like write code commenting, writing documentation, which you know was one of the things that came up in our word cloud earlier. Um, and then there's you know maybe some more advanced stuff like uh, version control workflows, containerization, um, stuff like that. Um, now, what I want you to try and do is to rank these in order of, of how important they are. Now, don't I know it's a bit complex and there's a lot of options there. Don't worry too much about this. Um, and if there's if there's stuff on there that you're not sure what it is, then you can just ignore them. I think you, you only have to rank certain the things that you select to rank. Um, but I'm 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 interested in getting a broad picture of what people see as the most important things to in ensure reproducibility and the least important things. So I'll give you a few moments to do that because it's uh, and gold star to whoever, whoever has already done it. And if that's you, James, you've got two gold stars. <laughs> it isn't. Uh. <laughs> And whilst we're looking at these, I'm, I'm in also interested to know if there's stuff that you think's missing from this list. Um, there's only 18 of us, so feel free to unmute yourself and say if you've got any comments. Um, if there's yeah, if there's anything that you think is really important in ensuring reproducibility that but that I've missed off this list, 
there'll definitely be stuff that isn't on there that I just haven't thought of or we just haven't thought of. And if you don't want to unmute yourself, feel free to, to stick it in the, um, the Google Docs. Um, there's a section at the bottom that you can write notes. Can I make a suggestion, Sam? Yeah, please do. So, so I think alongside do, uh, uh, dockerization, containerization here, I, I guess in the same kind of breath, I would say uh, dependency management, environment management. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of with yeah. the same goal as, as containerization, I guess. Yes. Cool. So we've got we've got 13 responses, which I think is pretty good. Uh, I'll just give you a few more moments. 14, nice. A few more moments and we will move on. 15, awesome. All right. And unsurprisingly, documentation is at the top of the list again. That's cool. So we've got documentation, version control, super important, well-commented code, testing, then code review, platform independence, adding a license, um, community repositories, containerization, then version control workflows, and generating a DOI. And I think what's quite nice about this order is that maybe with the exception of, of Git, the things that are at the top are are kind of easy wins. They're the, you know, writing documentation is actually not that difficult. Um, commenting your code, it's a bit time consuming, likewise with documentation, but it's not, you know, it's not too difficult. Um, so that's nice. These are kind of, maybe we can see these as easy wins, things that we can do to easily promote reproducibility. And then it's the stuff at the bottom, like containerization, that's really complex, um, but it's not necessarily such an important thing. Um, so just to <clears throat> just to take two example levels, so I, I'm, I'm taking this barely repeatable level as an example first. Um, so what does this mean, barely repeatable? Basically, it's, it's code that's rerunnable on the same computer by the same person that produces results that are in line, maybe not exactly as they were before, but in line with what is expected. Um, and it's broadly speaking code that's intended for single or occasional use by one person. Uh, and the key defining feature here is that it wouldn't be of any use to anybody else. Um, examples, producing graphs, presentations, um, or back of the envelope type calculations, or proof of concept, toy programs, that kind of thing. So the next question, um, again, it's, it's these, these same um, options that I've given you. So hopefully you're roughly familiar with them now. But what I want to know is thinking about this barely repeatable level, um, which of these best practices, tools, et cetera, do you consider essential for this level? So to meet, to meet that, um, that picture of simple scripts that are used by one person once or a few times, uh, which of these tools, best practices are essential for this level? And again, if there's anything that you think I've missed off here that uh, you think are relevant to this barely repeatable level, then, then do say. There's a weather update. It stopped raining here, so I could have I could have ticked the cloudy box. Cool. We've got 14, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to move on now, and I think this updates as well. Once of well commented code. Cool. It's really interesting that this comes on. So before we had documentation was the the leader, I think, if I remember correctly. But actually, for this this bottom level, the most important thing is well commented code, uh, and you know that makes sense, doesn't it? Because 
you're only documenting it for yourself to use the code again. And actually, one of the best forms of documentation for yourself is by commenting code. Um, you can kind of wrap those two things into one. It's interesting that version control gets a mention here as well. Even for simple scripts, version control can definitely be useful. Uh, and yeah, it's useful to test stuff, even if it's just really simple code, it's, it's good to know that it works. And then no, basically nobody thinks that platform independence, DOIs, community repositories are relevant here. And then there's a few people that say containerization, version control workflow, um, adding a license code review, stuff like that is still has use at this lower level. I'm kind of curious, we haven't got time, unfortunately, to dig into this too much, but if you've got opinions on, on you know, what, basically why you think containerization or why you think Git flow are really important at this baseline level, um, it'd be great to see those in the Google Doc. Okay, so moving up to the top level, uh, research software as infrastructure. Um, so the, the, this is basically software that's involved in multiple outputs by multiple groups of people, uh, likely have multiple developers uh, and is used over an extended period of time. Um, this is the type of software that's used by the whole community, which could be the research area, or it could be more broadly. Um, and the key thing here is that it should be thought of and maintained as infrastructure. Um, so the, the, there's a couple of examples that I've pulled out here. It could be research area or domain specific software like um, the Earth system, Earth system modeling framework for, for Earth system modeling. Um, or, you know, more broadly, ubiquitous, ubiquitous software like NumPy and, and SciPy. OK, and you'll be bored of this list by now, but it's here again. Um, which of these which of these do you think are important at this research software as an infrastructure level? Um, maybe I should have phrased this as which of these aren't important, but we'll see. We'll see when we get the answers through. And again, if, if there's anything you think is missing, um, and you know the, the infrastructure levels are complex levels, so I can very much envisage that the, there might be workflows and, and tools and best practices that you do think are missing. Um, that would be really interesting to know. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and say something now or put it in the Google Doc. All right, we're up to 15 already, which I guess might mean that most people have ticked most boxes. <laughs> so testing, really important. Yeah, definitely. Documentation, because you want you want users, absolutely. Um, Well-commented code, because you want extra developers, external developers. Um, version control, obviously. Um, and then then there's a there's a higher importance on things like packaging and putting it in community repositories, uh, platform independence, having a license. Okay, so on to what this um, what this session is all about and what what the idea and this is this is an idea that I'm kind of pursuing during my SSI fellowship year, which is this year. Um, my idea is to create uh, an interactive tool which helps researchers decide which level their software should be at um, and gives them targeted guidance based on that level. Um, so this is how it will work. Basically, this tool will ask the researchers some simple questions about their software. Um, and then there'll be some fancy algorithm in there that, that blends, these, blends these answers together and te can tell the researcher what level of reproducibility their software should be at, um, either from those levels of reproducibility that I introduced earlier, but there's absolutely scope to change them if, if folk don't think that they're appropriate levels. Um, and then based on this, the user will be presented with a list of recommendations. Um, so including some of those things that were just on that, those lists of options, they're presented with these recommendations uh, and targeted guidance 
based on these recommendations to help them meet these. And just as a quick walkthrough of how this could um, how this could work in practice, I've picked one question here, but ultimately there's going to be multiple questions. Um, but I think one of the key questions is how many users will your software have? Um, so if we think about barely repeatable software, we've already said that that's the kind of software that only one person uses. Um, the research software as infrastructure, that's software that many people use. Uh, and then it gets a little bit more ambiguous in the middle, but you can think of research software for publication. Uh, one to a few people use that software. Um, and then research software as a tool, a few people use it. Although I haven't defined what a few means. Um, and then if we think about first level, barely repeatable, what recommendations can we give people? Um, these are the things, some of the things that we pulled out earlier, like documentation, writing code, simple testing, that was that was seen as a, as a key thing. And then consider version control. Some people think version control is important. It might not be, it depends, kind of depends on your use case. Um, then the next level, you can start thinking about other things like licensing, good commenting, documentation, good enough for others to run your code if there are a few of you involved. Um, and then moving on to a more robust version control system. Okay, so this is a bit more of a complex question in the sense that I'm asking you to write uh, questions out here. Um, so what I'm interested, I gave you an example of one question there, which was how many um, users the software have. What I'm interested in is if you think there are other questions that would help define which level your software is at. And I won't say too much more because I don't want to influence, but just think about those, think about those different levels, um, what the defining features of those levels are. Um, and then what would help an interactive tool decide to meet those levels? Nice. Yeah, that's a really good one. How serious are the implications of failure? During the writing of this article, we got on to talking about software that's used in like space missions, uh, software that's used in nuclear bunkers and things like that, where <clears throat> you know the implication of a of a failure in the software is pretty cataclysmic. So what is the purpose? What does the software add that doesn't exist elsewhere? Could, it, could you contribute to another project? Yeah, that's a good question. Can you describe how to use a basic functionality in five minutes? Cool, some great answers there. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll move on, but I don't know if maybe it lets you stay on this question. If it doesn't, and if you think of any more questions, um, please do go and put them in the in the Google Doc, uh, which I've noticed stuff, people are writing stuff in the Google Doc, which is awesome. I haven't had a chance to read through that yet, but thank you very much. Yeah, and I think this is my final question. Um, what existing guidance could the tool point users towards? So I've, I've, what I've, <laughs> I've kind of glossed over this point, but I keep saying that the tool will um, point users towards targeted guidance. Um, the plan here is very much to, to collect some of the amazing resources that are already out there um, and point users towards the resources from those that, that best meet what they want to do. Um, 
so here I'm kind of interested in learning, um, and this is very much a learning thing for me, learning some of the, the amazing resources that are out there, because to give an example, until yesterday's session, um, and maybe somebody's writing this already, but until yesterday's session, I didn't know anything about code check. Um, but I think code check sounds like an amazing resource for getting code review, basically, or well, at least checking that your, your code actually runs. Um, Not surprised the Turing way has come up. That's good. <laughs> I mean, the Turing way has lots to say about reproducibility, and it's it's an amazing resource. <laughs> yeah, this is interesting. I mean, there's stuff in here that, that I've never um, come across. What are Elixir RDM bytes? Nice papers. I think if I remember correctly, those papers that that good enough, the good enough practices papers was very much something that like gave us a bit of inspiration for that article that we wrote. Um, in thinking about well, it's not it's not all about meeting all of these complex tools and doing all of these complex things to make your software reproducible. Re reproducible. Um, some simple software only needs to meet simple practices. Okay, I'm going to move on because um, we've got three minutes left. But likewise, feel free to um, to carry on commenting if you can do that when I move on. Uh, if not, just just put stuff in the Google Docs. That would be great. Um, so a final a final plea. So so basically. Uh, I'm interested in collaborators for this. Um, the tool, as you've probably guessed, is is very much in the early stages of development, as in I'm just thinking about how it could be structured at the moment. Um, and I want people's input. Um, I want to consult with people because I, you know, I don't claim to be an expert in reproducibility. Uh, and only in, in the short half an hour that we've had today, I think I've learned some things. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in um, People are interested in helping out, and it doesn't have to be in a really time onerous way. It could just be filling out a few surveys or answering a few questions. Uh, so if you if you are interested, then please put a go back to that Google Doc um, and put a tick or a Y or a yes or something by your name to say that you're interested. Um, and after the workshop, I'll get in touch with you all and and start thinking about next steps. Okay, um, we've got two minutes to go, but I think we should probably wrap up there and give time to do a rapid handover. Um, so thanks very much everyone for, for taking part in that. Got some great answers from those um, and I'll share those answers around in this, this, Google's, in this Google Doc afterwards if you wanna come by and, and check back. Cheers, all right. I'm going to stop screen sharing.